Okay, aloha everyone. Uh, welcome to the Board of Land and Natural Resources uh, oral arguments uh, held in Hilo, Hawaii. It is um, February 12th. Uh, here we are in the uh, Hilo uh, County uh, building. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the kupuna who came and pikai the room uh, at the beginning. I'm sure that the intent really was for the, the cleansing of, of everyone uh, in the room. So I appreciate that. Mahalo to the uh, Hawaii Island uh, County uh, offices for allowing us to have this hearing in this room. I want to remind people in the audience that this is uh, oral arguments and it is not public, it's not a public hearing, so we won't be taking public testimony. It is the petitioners um, in the in the contested case hearing uh, for the conservation district use permit that are um, to be heard today. So I just wanted to make that very, very clear. The order is the University of Hawaii will present, if they wish they can reserve some time for rebuttal, and then the uh, petitioners uh, will present uh, and then the, we will close the, uh, if there is rebuttal, we'll hear rebuttal, and then we will close the hearing with decision making to uh, be done at a later time. So with that, um, aloha, we'll start with uh, Tim Louis Kwan. Aloha, Jordan Ailo. Aloha, Chairman Isla, members of the line board. Uh, may I sit? Sure. Presenting, thank you. My name is Tim Louie Kwan. I'll be presenting the final arguments for the applicant University of Hawaii at Hilo. With me today are members, other members of my our legal team. I have Ian Sanderson on my left and Jay Hanlon on my right. Excuse me, Tim. Um, yes. One other piece of information that's important is each side is going to be given 30 minutes to present. Do you want to reserve time for rebuttal at this time? Uh, yes, I would like to reserve um, at least 10 minutes um, of my 30 minutes for rebuttal. Uh, if the timekeeper can actually prompt me at 15 minutes and again at 20, I'd appreciate it. Okay, shall do so. So your time begins now. Okay, thank you. If you can keep your voice up a little bit. Okay, Jean, how's this? Is it okay? Okay, thank you. Um, also with me today is uh, University of Hawaii at Hilo Chancellor, Dr. Donald Straney, and and Ms. Stephanie Nagata, who is Director of uh, the Office of Monarchy and Management, or OMKIM. Uh, we'd like to thank the board for and the department staff for coming to Hilo today to hold oral arguments in the contested case hearing on this application for the construction of the 30 meter telescope, more easily referred to as the TMT. It has been nearly two years to the day, or just a fortnight shy since this board issued this preliminary ruling on the TMT application ordering the holding of this contested case. A proceedings in which the parties were put to their proof in providing credible evidence supporting their claims and ultimately their position on whether a conservation district use permit should be issued. However, the evidentiary proceedings before the hearing officer is done and the parties are here today provide you uh, with a summary of the legal reasons why they should prevail, a summation of the evidence and the legal authority. While an important part of the due process, oral argument is not evidence. It is only argument. It's important to keep in mind the scientific and educational purpose of this project, which is considered when completed along with the large Hadron Collider constructed at the CERN project in Switzerland to be one of the two greatest scientific achievements of this century. As noted by Professor Michael Bolt in his testimony, the study and observation of the universe is the oldest of the exact sciences. That stretches far back into man's prehistory. Astronomy is one of the first subjects recorded in historical accounts by the planet's earliest literate civilizations. In ancient Egypt, the date for the annual flooding of the Nile was predicted by the helical rising of a star. Um, their observations of the heavens also tell the main kingdoms of Central America when to go to war and the Chinese went to start their new year, Kung Hee Fa Choi. Our earliest innated observations allowed us to measure time, when and what to hunt, gather and plant. Later, the study of the stars 
and planets took us to far places and countless journeys over trackless expanses and made it possible for us to navigate our way home. It has seen the rise and fall of every great civilization and witness the creation of all the world's religions, often providing the foundations for the religious beliefs and cultural practices. And its believers with proof that a universe so large and complex could only be the work of God or gods. So intertwined in our history was the study of religion and astronomy, the science of astronomy, that it was not separated in the West until the time of Galileo and Newton. In the present, we find evidence of our origins and that of the universe, which is the totality of all space, time, matter, and energy. As described in the application and confirmed by the evidence submitted by the applicant uh, during the hearings, the TMT is not just another telescope. Its segmented primary mirror spanning nearly 100 feet will be 10 times more powerful and far more advanced than the largest telescopes in operation today, um, the twin Keck telescopes in Mauna Kea, allowing us to see further, farther and with more detail than anything in operation. Once the TNT is operational, it'll be the first in the next generation of giant telescopes that will seek the answers for questions on the nature, origin, and composition of the universe, and whether there is life elsewhere out there. The selection of Mauna Kea as a site for the construction of the TMT is essential if Mauna Kea will continue to be the world's best ground-based viewing platform for astronomy. After considering six possible locations in Chile, Mexico, and Hawaii, it was determined that Mauna Kea's viewing conditions, its high altitude, atmospheric clarity, relative darkness, together with the accessibility of the Mauna Kea Science Reserve and its outstanding support facilities and infrastructure and neighboring observatories and a supportive local community made the selection an easy choice. Its location on the mountain's northwestern plateau was identified in the 2000 master plan. Excuse me. Is best suited for this type of observatory at a lower elevation and less visible than the other telescopes within the precinct while avoiding the most sensitive areas in terms of Mauna Kea's natural and cultural resources. The location selected provides additional mitigation while providing access to a spectacular night sky, another precious resource of Mauna Kea, allowing the TMT, in the words of Professor Bolte, a wonderful unit, union to the universe. Current investment in astronomy in Mauna Kea is close to $1 billion. However, the investment of the, the TMT project and other supporting services is expected to more than double that by the time the facility is completed. The project will be an enormous benefit to the public welfare and bring significant monies to the local economy as well as contribute new programs and funds to Big Island schools. Moreover, these benefits have been vetted and discussed with the community and all, at all of the public meetings during the planning process. As described in the record, the TMT project will, employ, will provide employment and educational opportunities for Hawaii in a clean, high-tech endeavor that will be a source of pride for the community while advancing our understanding of the universe. Petitioners here have been involved in the planning process long before the submission of this application in September 2010. However, they now claim that they've been denied due process in these proceedings. The truth is that most of the same petitioners have been involved in the planning process from the very beginning, even bringing a challenge to the board's adoption of um, the Mauna Kea Comprehensive Ma Management Plan, the CMP, and its subplans, uh, though resulting instead in the Intermediate Courts of Appeals affirmation of the board's action and, and process in approving the CMP. Petitioners have had an abundance of due process, and they have had more than ample opportunity to prove their claims that the board's criteria for issuance of a CDUP for the construction and operation of the TMT um, has not been met. They submitted testimony at the public hearing on the application. They fully participated in the contested case hearings held over a six month period in 2011 as reflected in the proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. Um, what the petitioners experienced was not a denial of due process. It was a failure proof, a failure proof to support their claims, claims they argued vigorously, repeatedly, and repeatedly. In truth, they would oppose any further telescope development, no matter where placed within the astronomy precinct, and no matter what manner of construction. 
The board delegated to the hearing officer the responsibility to hear, review, and consider evidence offered by the parties in support of the respective positions. His proposed findings and conclusions should be afforded considerable deference as he was able to assess the credibility and demeanor of the witnesses during the testimony and weigh the evidence submitted um, in proof of their claims. Uh, the applicant supports the finding and conclusions proposed by the hearing officer subject to a few suggested additions and changes as set out in our January 9th, 2013 exceptions. As noted in our exceptions, it is a university position that findings and conclusions proposed by the hearing officer on November 30th, 2012 are overwhelmingly correct but feels that several areas uh, require clarification to more fully and clearly reflect the proceedings. The proposed exceptions seek more clarification rather than substantially modifying the hearing officer's proposed determinations. While these suggestions are detailed in our, our submitted exceptions, I did want to outline several, including clarification of the scope of uh, this board's action on February 25, 2011, which was not the board's final action on the application. In light of uh, your simultaneous ordering of a contested case on your own motion, and the board's imposition of, of condition 21, prohibiting any construction unless and until a final decision was rendered in favor of the applicant at the conclusion of the contested case. The applicant further suggests that the proposed conclusions also reflect the Hawaii Supreme Court's intervening decision in the state v. Pratt versus Pratt uh, that was um, handed down and decided in 2012. The holding in Pratt is relevant to the issues in this contested case as the Pratt Court confirmed that even if all three elements of the Hanapi test are met, the privilege for Native Hawaiian customary and traditional practices are not absolute and may be subject to, to reasonable state regulation. The Pratt Court directed that, claim of, that claims of right must be considered within a totality of circumstances where there must be a balancing of the state's interests in the subject regulation uh, to the right of the individual in the exercise of particular practice. The other significant exception um, uh, suggestion as an exception to the proposed findings inclusion that accurately reflects the petitioner's failure of proof of the first prong of the Hanapi test. As petitioners did not submit direct testimony or specific evidence that they are, quote, descendants of Native Hawaiians who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands prior to 1778. This is a specific evidentiary requirement set out in Hanapi, Pash, and, and Pratt. All three cases talk about the evidentiary requirement. Uh, while several of the petitioners testified that, that in fact they were Native Hawaiians, none submitted testimony and evidence of evidence demonstrating descent from Native Hawaiians who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands prior to 1778. Uh, the hearing officer correctly found and concluded that the TMT project satisfies eight criteria of uh, HAR, Hawaii Administrative Rules, Section 13-5-30, subsection C. Um, uh, while petitioners claim that all eight criteria must be satisfied in issuing the CDUP, the argument is pointless as the hearing officer correctly concluded that the criteria, uh, all the criteria of um, subsection C are actually satisfied. The hearing officer concluded and, and correctly that the project was consistent with the purpose of the district, the conservation district, as one of the specific objectives of the district is to conserve and protect important resources through appropriate management. This is exactly what has been accomplished in this project with the adoption of the TMT project plan that is consistent with the state's uh, CMP for Mauna Kea. The management plan specifically and thoughtfully addresses Mauna Kea's natural and cultural resources, including the environmental factors that make Mauna Kea arguably the best place on earth to put telescopes. The express purpose of the district rules is to regulate land use, not to prohibit land use as claimed by the petitioners. Hearing officer also correctly concluded that the project is consistent with the objectives of the resource subzone as astronomy facilities are expressly permitted in the subzone under an approved management plan. Um, and again, um, under subsection C of the criteria, the hearing officer cor correctly found that the project complies with the guidelines and provisions set out in um, HRS Chapter 205A 
of the CZMA. This is the only CZMA objective for the project which concerns uh, the, the, the protection of water quality. The applicant's witnesses provided testimony that the project has been designed so that wastewater and pollutants would not be released into the surrounding environment. Petitioner's assertion that the TMT would undermine important viewplanes, destroy areas of historic importance, and increase the risk of water pollution were considered and rejected by the hearing officer. Uh, the hearing officer was responsible for weighing the evidence and assessing the credibility of the witnesses. The hearing officer also concluded that they would not be, that the project would not cause substantial impacts to existing natural resources within the surrounding area, community, or region. Um, and we've, uh, we've detailed in, in considerable detail um, um, the reasons why um, he correctly found that. He, also correctly concluded that the proposed land use is compatible with the locality and surrounding areas. While petitioners admit there are numerous observatories visible from the project and its surrounding areas, they wrongly contend that the project must reduce the cumulative impacts created by existing uh, facilities to lessen substantial, significant, and adverse. This was rejected by the hearing officer who concluded that the project had satisfied this criterion. Um, under the, the, the next, the hearing officer found that the project preserves, correctly found that it, it, the project preserves and improves upon the existing physical and environmental aspects of land. Petitioners interpret this to prohibit adding any structure where none currently exists in the subzone, even where the regulations expressly permit astronomy facilities and other structures under, manage, under a, uh, an appropriate management plan. To conclude that this criterion must be interpreted to literally mean that nothing that can be built on any part of the, the district would lead to an absurd, an absurd or unjust result. This was rejected by the hearing officer who concluded that this criterion was also met. He also found, hearing officer also found that, um, that there would be no subdivision of land utilized to increase the intensity of land uses in the conservation district. Um, the reason for this is the applicant is not seeking a subdivision of land, nor is one being granted by the board. Even if we were seeking in one, um, government agencies and agencies of the state and the counties are not subject to um, that provision, cited, provision of, of the HRS cited by the petitioners. Legally and factually, there has been and will be no subdivision. 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, petitioners also presented no credible, credible evidence of any detriment um, to the public health, safety, and welfare in Mauna Kea. Um, he found that the university's experts and evidence were more credible and in rejecting the petitioner's claims. And I would like to um, thank the board again for the opportunity for the summation of the applicant's position that the proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law are correct. Um, if the exceptions suggested by the applicant in our January 9th, 2013 submission are also adopted by the board, I wanted to recognize the patient and effort of the hearing officer in conducting the contested case proceedings. I would also like to note the conduct and performance of the petitioners and what, is, which, and what has been a long and sometimes tedious process. The parties have all acted professionally and respectfully towards the hearing officer, the applicant, and each other, and I commend them again for this. I would like to reserve again the remaining time that I have for rebuttal. Thank you very much. Yeah. 14 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Um, next petitioner up is Kinohi Nevis for. Good evening. 
Okay, let's have some order here. No, I'm going to say my piece. This guy. Oh, well, yeah. No more. Abel. Uh, Abel. So are you. So am I. I'm Abel. So let me. So treat us guys right when you guys come over here, okay? We're not just something you guys can wash underneath the ground. Nobody's washing anybody. Okay. Abel. Abel, I'm going to. You can do whatever that you like. I will. You run this, but you run my life. I stay with God. I don't know about you. Okay, we're going to move on, Abel. Thank right you. On. You're cutting into the petitioner's time, Abel. Okay, now we're gonna we're gonna start now. Your 30 minutes starts now. Okay. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Kinohi Nevis. I'm speaking on behalf of my father, Paul K. Nevis. Aloha to the God whose name is so sacred, it is not spoken in the open, but in the reverent silence of the believer. Aloha in Akini Akua, the four gods of state, Ku, Kane, Lono, and Kanaloa, the 40 gods, the 400 gods, the 4,000 gods, the 40,000 gods, the 400,000 gods, and all the manifestations of the one God whose sacred name is in the whisper. All you spirits of the departed who have been cared for with love, I welcome you here. Aloha ina omakua, you personal and family guardians. Advise and guide us and do what you must to strengthen our relationships with each other and the land. Aloha na ali'i, fellow activists, customary leadership, whose kuleana is to continue the flow of mana. Blessings for all our people your fellow countrymen, by being generous and productive resource managers. You have been an eyewitness to all that Akua has provided from time immemorable to our people and our land. You have also been an eyewitness to an ongoing crime scene of unspeakable proportion upon those same people and those same lands. You Ali'i men and Ali'i women, fellow activists, we are all called to serve our people with our very lives. These days and times require that we give our very life for our country, the Hawaiian Kingdom. This nation will require a new age of heroes who have integrity and honor, morals, ethics, compassion, self-sacrifice, and a desire to fight and serve their own country. No foreign entity, occupational authority, or an agency of any state can ever erase the crime scene. Only generous and competent leaders who serve with integrity can begin to heal our people and our land and rediscover our destiny as a free and independent people. From Mauna Kea comes the snow and ice, solitude and quiet to nurture the hearts and minds of the people. Do not sell out, and the people will remember your name with honor. Give in to today's desires of money, power, and personal gratification, and your name will be spoken in shame and without honor, maybe not even at all. Aloha na kupuna na makua our elders and fellow parents and workers. We have searched in the last 40 years the truth of what happened to our people and our nationhood. The state of Hawaii didn't help us in our search, neither did the United States of America. We, the Kanaka Maoli people, and our friends did the searching ourselves. Out of our own despair and empty pockets, at work and after work, from a secretary's desk or from a tent in some remote beach. We did it ourselves, with our copy machines, our notepads and flyers, and in our protests and marches, our arrests and sit-ins, our voices, and our burning desire for justice. Yes, many kupuna and makua have died giving rebirth to a nation reborn, a patriotic duty to a good and decent cause. Stand up, we did, 
and encouraged our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to do the same. For the, truth, the, for the truth does matter, doesn't it? The lies that we were taught or forced to listen to since 1893 were educational indoctrination. Genocide of the worst sort, a living death sentence for the people of this land and our fellow Hawaiian nationals. There is no going back to a time when the occupation did all it could to erase our spiritual will to live, our cultural knowledge to survive, and our political nationality to be free. Aloha opio, keiki and kamali'i, our young people, children and babies. Know you are loved. Know that what we are doing is to ensure that your land, this land, your inheritance, our aina will be here for you to live upon and for you to pass on to your descendants. It is what we must do and what you will have to do when our nation calls. So learn to watch and listen carefully. Never fear to speak out for this land and your people. Call the, lawyer, call the lawyer out to task and a senator to service. They are no better than you. In fact, they may be far behind. Your culture extends thousands of years. What has been their experience on the world stage? 235 years. Know that your ancestors were warriors and healers, planners and builders, navigators and farmers, philosophers and poets, dancers and fishermen, priests and astrologers, leaders and team players, scientists and sportsmen, clean and hardworking, deeply religious and spiritually active. Be proud and follow in their path as we do. Know that they and we are always with you. Okia Kamanava, now is the time. It has taken me 45 years to find myself as a spirit-led being, culturally a Kanaka Maoli native person, and politically a Hawaiian national. I can recall my journey beginning with the simple stories from my mother. Her memories of the pain of disenfranchisement ridicule and survival under the yoke of a foreign master, the United States. These stories were my mother's love for a confused young man of 13 years old. They were told in a style that at times made me cry and laugh, but most of all set me on a path to save myself. They were inspirational and clear, deeply spiritual, culturally beautiful and bitterly political. I was broken, angry like many of my brothers and sisters. Mauna Awakea is that vahipana, that sacred place that has made me a whole person. No longer do I need to seek refuge somewhere in a godless world that follows a godless path. The spiritual worship on and with the spiritual life of Mauna Kea completes my lifelong search for who I am as a Kanaka, a free Hawaiian man. To this Mauna Kea, I owe my life story, my mother's prayers, my wife's love, and my children's future. Mauna Kea is that natural environment that breathes life into me and causes me to reflect on the creative spirit within me. The shadow of Mauna Kea holds my heart close in the early evening and renews my daily walk each and every new day. Over the past 15 years, I have become a more creative and tolerant person because of my relationship to the mountain. I hold my people in a more hopeful light with less doubt and with a greater anticipation of a brighter future. Mauna Kea has restored my family beyond my greatest aspirations. As I have witnessed this transformation, so also have I witnessed the transformation of many others as they sought answers to questions deep in their hearts. Time and time again, Mauna Kea has spoken to the many. 
many people who truly seek out the creative force of Mauna Kea that emanates in this most sacred place. Every morning I look to Mauna Kea and acknowledge what Keakua has done for me, for my family and for my people. Mauna Kea is the creator's home, the pico, the center force, the greatest temple on earth. As an ali'i, I am honored and humbled by Mauna Kea and will continue to encourage the spiritual enlightenment that Mauna Kea brings to the human community. As a kumuhula, I am inspired by Mauna Kea each and every day. I will continue to do all I can to keep Mauna Kea accessible to all who see seek spiritual refreshment and renewal. As a husband and father, I have an obligation for the welfare of my ohana to live the breath of Mauna Kea within me and in all that I do and say. If I need to be a warrior, so be it but it will be a warrior armed with aloha. The 30 millimeter telescope TMT, telescope development, in this my sacred temple of religious practice will seriously interfere with my ability to adore Mauna Kea. How can we put our shattered lives back together again if these foreign objects are allowed to alter the natural landscape in the natural temple Mauna Kea? As our kupuna have said, when is enough enough? How can we be in solitude and beauty with these foreign objects in our view planes? View planes that have existed since these islands were created by Keakua. I recognize the natural view planes created by Akua. What church of these foreigners would allow such a desecration before their altar? What would they allow it to be? Would a camouflage be acceptable? A paint job? Would they tell their congregation to just look the other way? Would they take money to look the other way? Would the interests outside of their church be allowed to dictate the process? Wouldn't that church consider this sacrilegious? Why is Mauna Kea allowed to be desecrated, but not St. Peter's? Could it be that the godless are worshiping a golden calf? Why are the laws that are in place to protect the trust lands of the native Hawaiians and the general public being broken without objection? What are regulations like the eight criteria for a conservation district use permit for HAR 13530. Criteria number one, the proposed land use is consistent with the purpose of a conservation district. How can this 18 story building be consistent with conservation? That's impossible. A conservation district is to conserve land deemed very important. By developing that land, you devalue its purpose. To contemplate developing conservation land, you bring injury upon us who worship there and are practicing our customs. Are not the laws in place to protect the land and the people's interests? They clearly are written to be followed, are they not? Does a developer pick and choose which ones he wishes to adhere to? Why do we have regulators who are failing miserably in their oversight? Is mitigation part of the eight criteria? Where is that found in the statutes? Why do we have regulators who are failing miserably in their oversight? Amen. Is mitigation part of the A criteria? Where is that found in the statutes? Why do the elected officials show no backbone when these laws and regulations are being broken? Where are the cops? Why is someone not being arrested? Is this not a crime scene? No, do it on Mount Fuji. 
Criteria number four. The proposed land will not cause substantial adverse impacts to existing natural resources within the surrounding area, community, or region. It is quite obvious that this TMT proposal will impact the natural resources, the surrounding area, the community, in fact, the whole island. You can't hide a huge thing like the TMT proposal by air, land, or sea. How that would hurt us who need a spiritual place in this natural setting to keep our lives together. Criteria number six. The existing physical and environmental aspects of land, such as natural beauty and open space characteristics, will be preserved or improved upon, whichever is applicable. Natural, as defined by Webster's Dictionary, means produced or existing by nature, not artificial. Natural in Hawaiian Dictionary, among other things, means honest, decent, proper, appropriate, satisfactory, rightful, reliable, right, just, fair, qualified, suitable, advisable, seemly, fit, natural, applicable, nearby, worth, and merit. <coughs> This TMT proposal does not fit criteria number six, nor does it preserve or improve upon the open space that exists there at this very moment. And this is why I'm absolutely against this TMT proposal and any other proposal on sacred Mauna Kea, our place of worship and religious practice. And I hope that you can see it too one day. Okay, thank you. Mahalo. Marty. Aloha Chairman Isla, members of the Board of Land Natural Resources. My name is My name is Marty Townsend. I'm here on behalf of Kahea, the Hawaiian Environmental Alliance. It's been a long time since we've saw each other last. By my count, it's two years since we met. I can't imagine why it's taken so long. It took the hearing officer's report a year to be released, even though it's basically a copy and paste of the university's proposed findings of fact. I object to how long this process has taken. It has really taken a toll on everyone, the petitioners, and probably the applicants as well. Uh, and I really want the Board of the Natural Resources on a, in a broader way to take back to, and take to heart how hard this process is on people. All of the petitioners are volunteers. All of them have personally put up their own money to participate in this contested case hearing. And for this process to take two years, even more, leading up to that February hearing in 2010, is unacceptable. Because it's taken so long, I feel it's important to remind you why we're here. We are here today because the university has failed to fulfill its obligations to protect the conservation district of Mauna Kea for many decades. The eight criteria of the conservation district rules direct the board to put the natural resources of the conservation district at the center of its decision making. When we focus on the resources and when we make decisions in their best interest, then the intent of the conservation district rules will be satisfied and our natural resources will actually thrive. As it is, the university and past boards have put the interest of the developers at the center of their decision making, not the resources. 
and it shows. The summit is 38 feet shorter than it was before telescopes found it. <laughs> Invasive species are advancing up the mountain. And it is by focusing on developer interests that the university now attempts to justify expanding the industrial footprint of telescopes on Mauna Kea. Their argument continues to focus on the seeing conditions of the mountain rather than the natural resources that are identified for protection in the conservation district rules. The fact that Mauna Kea has good seeing conditions for astronomy, for modern astronomy, does not mandate another telescope be built there. I mean, beaches are an ideal place to put hotels from a developer's perspective, but that does not make it a good idea. The university seeks to disavow itself from its history of mismanagement on Mauna Kea, the many mercury spills, the harassment of Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners. But the fact is, this is the existing environmental aspects of the land that criterion number five requires to be improved upon. The existing conditions of the resources on Mauna Kea are the direct result of the industrialization caused by telescopes on the mountain. And the telescopes on the mountain are the direct result of the university's advocacy and facilitation of development of the Mauna Kea Conservation District. The university is the primary advocate for every single telescope on Mauna Kea. It cannot now stand before the board and say they will not be responsible for the harm caused by their past actions. The university has an obligation to improve upon the existing resources of Mauna Kea because it has facilitated the current damage that is suffered by the resources and because the rules mandate applicants improve upon the natural environment in which they are building in. Now the university have you believe that that's an absurd interpretation that can never build in a conservation district. That's not true. In this situation, to comply with criterion number five would mean fully restoring two current telescope sites before considering the proposal for a new one. As it is, the university makes empty promises to decommission telescopes in the future. Not only does the decommissioning plan not guarantee that a site will be fully restored to its natural condition, it's not part of this permanent application. There's no way for you to actually enforce that and make sure it happens. The university is promising to you now, please give us this permit to build and we promise someday in the distant future we will consider decommissioning. You have to ask yourself, well, what is inside the permanent application? What did they actually apply for? And they applied to build. They did not apply to decommission, to restore anything on the mountain. Instead of improving upon the natural environment and ensuring that the project would not have additional substantial adverse impact on the mountain, the university relies heavily on its comprehensive management plan. It's a great title, Comprehensive Management Plan, but we know what they say about covers. Looking deeper into the CMP reveals that it actually is more accurately described as an assessment plan, a plan for conducting future studies. For example, the Comprehensive Management Plan has 103 action items. Of those, 36 were deemed directly applicable to the TMT. Of those 36, 14 are planning and monitoring along the lines of study methods of invasive species spread, as opposed to actually stopping the spread of invasive species. Educate people about the historic, cultural, and natural resources of Mauna Kea, as opposed to actually protecting them. Encourage observatories to investigate options to reduce the use of hazardous materials in telescope op operations, as opposed to actually stopping the use of hazardous materials on Mauna Kea. The only real actions that were identified in the TMT management plan were things like prevent light pollution, which serves the TMT's interests, and follow the law, which is interesting because I can't even do that. These are nice first steps. I don't want to uh, 
put down the fact that we're going to educate people about the resources from Mauna Kea or that we're going to try and figure out and think about how we cannot use hazardous material. But these are first steps. This falls far short from offsetting the harm currently suffered on Mauna Kea. And it definitely does not justify building another telescope, expanding the industrial footprint on Mauna Kea. Even after the university consulted with Native Hawaiian practitioners over many years, including many of the petitioners before you today, the university did not adopt any of their substantial recommendations. The comprehensive management plan sets no limits on the, on the number of telescopes that could be built on Mauna Kea. What's worse is the university, instead of focusing on restoring the natural environment, is focused in this hearing on disqualifying some of the practitioners as Native Hawaiian culture practitioners. The university actually contends that the practitioners before you today did not prove that they were Native Hawaiian. How, How can a university contend that Uncle Ku or Auntie Pua, Kumu Paul Nevis, or any of the other Native Hawaiian practitioners, petitioners are not worthy of the board's attention? These are the very practitioners cited by the DLNR in their staff recommendation and cited by the university in their own reference materials. Please do not be distracted by slippery lawyering. Yeah. These petitioners are Native Hawaiian. They do engage in traditional and customary practices and should be granted the protections guaranteed to them by the state constitution. I realize that all of this slippery lowering and the long time that it's taken to get to this point has really muddied the case in some ways, made it complicated. So I'm going to take a moment to try and simplify it. <laughs> Kahea and the university's attorneys actually agree on quite a bit. We agree that the natural resources in the Mauna Kea have suffered as a result of telescope construction. We agree that the university has been and continues to be the primary advocate for telescope construction on Mauna Kea. We agree that the TMT would contribute to some degree to the harm to existing resources. On Mauna Kea. The difference is the university contends that it should be rewarded for this and granted a permit to build a new telescope and expand that harm. Exactly. While we think enough is enough already. The general lease for the university's managed lands will come to an end soon. The TMT would be a significant new and permanent eyesore on the northern plateau of Mauna Kea. It is foolish to build such a massive industrial structure in an imperiled conservation area when the whole undertaking could come to an end before the TMT becomes obsolete. This is substantial adverse impact to anyone who enjoys the view from Mauna Kea to Haleakala. Enough is enough already. Please deny the permanent application for the TMT. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Board members, any questions? For Marty? Okay. Thank you, Marty. Next petitioner is Deborah Ward. Aloha. Aloha. For the record, my name is Deborah J. Ward. I'm a petitioner. <clears throat> Boy. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking everyone here who takes a personal responsibility to preserve, protect, and care for our mountain, Mauna Kea. I've worked for the university for many years. I have a great deal of aloha for the university. However, my involvement in issues regarding the management of Mauna Kea began in the 1970s. As a recreational hiker, I visited Mauna Kea with my father, who was a physicist and an astronomer, when one telescope, smaller than the size of a garage, stood at the summit. The vast wilderness vistas from the highest peak in the Pacific were awe-inspiring, breathtaking, and serene. The sound of silence remains with me today. 
I returned to Mauna Kea as a hike leader with Lauren Gill while working at the Honolulu Botanic Gardens. I chaired the program committee of the Conservation Council of Hawaii in 1983 when I invited astronomers to present their plans for discussion at a public meeting. At that point, I was excited about what was going on on Mauna Kea, and I followed the development of the Mauna Kea Science Reserve Complex Development Plan in 1983 to 85, and remember the assurances regarding future compliance with administrative rules and limits on development. Expanded development on Mauna Kea was a very controversial topic in the community in the 1980s, and one of my kupuna, May Mall, was very instrumental in raising some of the issues that remain with us today 30 years later. Under pressure from Governor Ariyoshi and Mayor Kimura, the university promised a limit on the number of telescopes, a promise it no longer honors. I continued to use the trails and visit the summit of Mauna Kea during the 70s through the present for recreation, for wilderness experience, for the unfettered vistas and the silence and the spiritual peace and the natural beauty and the cultural significance. The cumulative impact of intensified industrial land use at the summit has really impacted my recreational enjoyment and spiritual practice. The, cultural, the cumul cumulative impact of the destruction of habitat the widespread waste accumulation, the obstruction of the view planes, the constant sound and alteration of the geology, the negative impact to the cultural practice of my colleagues is a source of personal grief. The summit would be silent if there were no development, but it's not silent. The noise of the observatory air conditioning and blowers, generators, associated vehicles and industrial activity is present and disturbing to many recreational users who hoped for the pristine silence of wilderness. The view of Mauna Kea's summit from my vantage point at my residence and from the beach at Hilo Bay and from my hiking trails on Mauna Loa are all fettered by the presence of multiple domes on the skyline. It's almost impossible to find a location on the island of Hawaii of Hawaii, where one cannot see a telescope in one's view of Mauna Kea. I believe I'm not alone in finding these visu visual obstructions a significant annoyance and an adverse impact. I remember Mayor Kimura saying the same thing. The legislative auditor in 1998, and I quote, said, DLNR has failed to define its relationship with the university, allowing the institution to oversee its own activities and not provide a mechanism to ensure compliance with lease and permit requirements. The auditor also reported that without permit conditions or controls to ensure implementation of management plans, the university was allowed to continue development without completing prior tasks outlined in manage management plans. Sorry. In 2003, my concerns led me to join a hui of petitioners, including Sierra Club, who took part in a contested case hearing and successful litigation to overturn the DLNR's um, permit for the Keck Outrigger Telescope development due to the absence of a current comprehensive management plan to address multiple uses on Mauna Kea. We were forced to intervene in the DLNR's management of Mauna Kea because BLNR abdicated its duty and its responsibility under the law to preserve and protect the summit. BLNR failed to comply with its own administrative rules requiring that it manage the natural resources in the conservation district pursuant to a comprehensive management plan. They actively opposed the appellant's efforts to bring DLNR into compliance with its own rules. DLNR administrative rules explicitly state that astronomy facilities are among the uses requiring approved management plans to address cumulative land proposals. Cumulative. The DLNR staff members have claimed that the infrastructure on Mauna Kea is crumbling and that active management of resources is constrained by lack of funds. This bolsters the argument that the petitioners have been making for years, fair market rent use needs to be paid for the world use of the world's premier astronomical location to pay for adequate resource management, 
infrastructure upkeep, and public safety. DLNR staff's position is that the only way to fund good management is to degrade the resource in order to collect rent from the new development to pay for the management's mistakes of the past. This is akin to a Ponzi scheme. The additive insult to the resource will not reduce the cumulative impact. This contested case has been conducted in order to provide information, examine the record, and demonstrate the harm this project will cause. We intend to provide the board with a better opportunity to make an informed decision regarding the 30 meter telescope application. I brought my concerns to this case because as a longtime recreational user, I've felt that it's my citizen's responsibility during these years to participate in dozens of hearings and meetings to help review and plan and propose appropriate management of the natural resources associated with Mauna Kea. I've contributed hundreds if not thousands of hours as a volunteer to this effort and not one hour has been compensated. Nor have I received any benefit from the effort other than the knowledge that Mauna Kea deserves the care and respect, and this has been affirmed by the tremendous community support that this effort has generated. At the same time, the university has expended millions of taxpayer funds to pay outside attorneys to represent the interests of California-based TMT Corporation and its partners. If I believed that my efforts had led to appropriate management, I wouldn't be sitting here. Instead, I have suffered as I observed observed the cumulative industrialization of the wild panorama of the summit. My best efforts have not remedied the habitat loss, the repeated pollution accidents, the introduction of multiple alien predators and weeds, the permanent and irreversible alteration of the geologic terrain, the summit landscape, which was once breathtakingly beautiful, has become more akin to a cityscape in my eyes. I hike to experience the wilderness, the ecosystems, and the habitats for native species, the constantly changing weather, the play of the light on the landscape, the serenity of silence, and the revelation of the ancestral and spiritual wisdom. The steady deterioration of the natural landscape, including the intrusion of visual distractions, noise, traffic, trash, access limitations, has really had a shattering impact on my recreational experience. To escape the sadness I feel when I'm surrounded by the buildings and the roads, I walk long distances to find landscapes free of the visual and psychic clutter. These places include the Northern Plateau, and Pu'u Poliahu, where I can gaze at Haleakala or Pu'u Makanaka without the industrial distractions. For this reason, I maintain that the proposal to build the 30 meter telescope on the northern plateau of, the Mount of Mauna Kea's summit region would further degrade, despoil, and irrevocably harm my rights to a clean and healthful environment. The proposition that an 18-story, five-acre industrial structure proposed to be built in a national natural landmark would have no significant impact boggles the imagination. The claim that the proposal is consistent with the purpose of the conservation district simply ignores the purpose set out in the law. Conservation districts were formed for the purpose of conserving, protecting, and preserving the important natural resources of the state through appropriate management to promote their long-term sustainability for the public health, safety, and welfare. The applicant contain, contends that virtually any telescope development they propose would be allowed because the comprehensive management plan and its subplans provide a framework of comprehensiveness and strength for managing development within the MKSR, I'm quoting. I strongly challenge that proposition. The CMP framework describes a functional management strategy, but it lacks actions to carry it out, and I assert that the criteria set forth in the law have not been met. Good intentions are empty promises if no action is taken to carry them out. A plan must actually be established with funding for managers with expertise in natural and cultural resources secured. An effective plan has timelines established. It has benchmarks to evaluate effectiveness of outcomes. It has effective DLNR oversight and consultation and enforcement for failure to act. The University of Hawaii is an educational institution. It's not a land management agency. 
The university claims to have a main management framework, but during the 12 years that I have served on the Environment Committee for UH's Office of Mauna Kea Management, no cultural or natural resource staff was employed to implement or manage these resources. In spite of the conditions set, in, set by DLNR in 1985, the plans, the permits, the monitoring, the control, and the remediation efforts that should have been in place for over a quarter of a century do not even exist. And UH OMKM lacks the staff and funds to carry them out. While some recommendations made by citizen scientists and, and practitioners over the years can be found in the CMP framework, the action to implement them is absent. So some of the issues that I bring to you are limits to development. While the number of telescopes and observatories already exceeds the upper limit named by the university in early management strategies, under the current management, the university has proposed 12 additional telescopes during the last 10 years. Only one's been implemented. The Master Plan 2000 and the Comprehensive Management Plan do not offer a rationale for the carrying capacity for the mountain, nor do they provide an accurate estimate of future development proposals anticipated. The university would have you believe that if the existing significant, substantial, adverse impact of 20 telescopes were 20, then the addition of one more telescope would be an additional increment of one, thus adding only one on the impact scale. And to quote from their document, that demonstrated, demonstrably does not cause substantial adverse impacts. By the university's absurd logic, it, if each and every new telescope were 10 times larger than the one that preceded it, and it were to construct 21 telescopes, the impact of the last, even though it's 1 million billion times larger than the first, would only be one on the impact scale. I show you this graph. I'm sorry, I constructed this last night about 11. But it's the only way I know to show you that this is one. Okay, this is one, and this is a hundred billion million, and this is ten times, each of these telescopes is ten times larger than the next one. If that were the case, there would be one, more than one increment of in impact. And the absurdity of this, that's, a, that's great, <laughs> the absurdity of this logic is played out when one considers the scale of the impact of the UH Hilo 24-inch telescope, which none of the petitioners objected to when it was rebuilt and uh, reconditioned and recycled. Anyway, I'd like to point that out because the university says we oppose all telescopes. That's not true. Um, the absurdity of the logic is played out when you look at the 24-inch telescope compared to this proposal telescope, which is 1,181 inches, that is more than 49 times larger than the first one. The impact to the habitat, the geologic resources, the view planes, the recreational and restorative environment is impacted to a far greater extent by the addition of a massive new element in the area, never before irrevocably altered by human forces. The university's postulate that the construction of a telescope large larger than the footprint of all the others combined would not be significant in this context because the existing impact caused by its own management with DLNR oversight was negligent is patently self-serving. It's unbelievable. Anyway, the destruction of habitat continues with no restoration. Since the university built its first telescope on Mauna Kea, 92 acres of Wekiu bug habitat in the summit area have been destroyed by telescope development. This is their own document. But no habitat restoration has been initiated, nor is restoration a, a condition of this current proposal. In spite of the Master Plan 2000 EIS statements that no habitat disturbance would be proposed, no new habitat disturbance would be proposed, the university's TMT EIS states that the project would disturb or destroy an additional 5.6 acres of habitat. The mitigation efforts recommended by experts hired by UH OMKM to address the habitat destruction are for the most part absent from the mitigation proposed by the TMT CMP. And you can read them all in the draft EIS, but they were not incorporated into the final and they were not incorporated into the CMP for the TMT. So, 
you have to wonder, why was it so inconvenient that they listened to their own experts? Next, there's no invasive species management plan. During the 12 years since OMKM was established, several invasive species of both plants and animals have been introduced. In spite of good intentions, monitoring for invasive species has been haphazard, and the control hasn't even been considered or initiated. The CMP calls for the development of an invasive species rapid response plan in conjunction with an invasive species monitoring plan for specific species considered the highest risks. But even these plans remain on the drawing board. Just as invasive species control and eradication permits for the science reserve are not yet in place 12 years later, nor are they in place for the TMT. During the decade of waiting for a plan, several new invasive and predatory insects have established a presence in the summit area. But during the contested case, OMKM interim director Nagata admitted that OMKM had no natural resources management staff. She said that funds for this purpose were not provided by the state legislature. Dependence on funds to be provided by our legislature in this cat-strapped economy demonstrates the failure of DLNR to follow the law requiring fair market rent for the use of our land. These funds should be used in part for appropriate management. The next is the inadequate hazardous waste plan, so our aquifers at risk. Under current management, accidental spills or hazardous, un hazardous materials and sewage continue to occur. In spite of good intentions, the materials continue to seep into the substrate and the aquifer. The applicant anticipates no accidents will befall the TMT and therefore assumes that protective measures in place ensure there will be no significant impact. These protective measures outlined in the EIS actually don't currently exist, nor do they exist in the science reserve as a whole. The CMP calls for guidelines and protocols for management of spills in the ha of hazardous waste, including mirror, mirror washing fluids, wastewater, and fuel accidents. But testi testimony from Director Nagata indicated that accidental releases within facilities are managed by each indi observatory's individual protocols. Outside the facilities, the leaks from vehicles might be handled by rangers overseen by the Mauna Kea Support Services, but no plan was identified for a larger spill, such as a truck carrying barrels of fuel. In its recommendations to the board, DLNR staff noted a e recent experience with a toxic material spill in May 2009, when a hydraulic line broke, releasing 7 to 12 gallons of fluid onto a concrete floor leaking through a six-inch drain pipe into the ground. When DLNR claimed the, the event was handled perfectly, it begs the question, why, after numerous incidents of spills have entered the ground through unsealed pipes in the past, was this drain pipe sealed only after the spill? Sealing the drain after the spill is akin to closing the barn door after the horse is left. With appropriate management, drains leading to the ground would have been clo closed years ago. The the university and next is decommissioning. The university claims there will be fewer telescopes when the lease expires, but planners and the public are left in the dark about the details. The CMP decommissioning plan leaves specifics regarding the extent of site restoration undefined. As a result, the costs and risks associated with decommissioning are difficult to gauge. The DLNR's 1977 Mauna Kea management plan required that full funding be set aside for both construction and decommissioning of permitted telescopes, but no such requirements have been put in place for the TMT. We learned this at the hearing, that funding is in place only through 2012, and that amount to be set aside for decommissioning is yet to be determined. Finally, the recreational resources are impacted by cumulative development. Okay, thanks. I'm almost done. The expanded individual, uh, sorry, ins expanded industrial development of telescope facilities, roads, visitor action to the wilderness. The northern plateau of Mauna Kea is not entirely pristine, but the vast landscape, the geologic terrain, the circle of shrines, and the silent interaction of light and shadow, the interplay of mist and snow on the plateau, are still a conservation resource treasured by the world. The loss of this resource would be irrevocable and is counter to the laws that protect this district. 
While TMT project claims it will make optimum use of the environmental factors associated with Mauna Kea, such as altitude and atmospheric clarity and distance from light sources, unfortunately the natural resources on the Earth's surface are placed at risk. The mitigation proposed does not address the impact of the TMT. The fourth criterion prohibits land uses that cause substantial adverse impact. Because the BLNR and the university have failed to address or mitigate the existing substantial impact on the mountain's resource, it's improper to consider any new projects that would contribute more impact in any way. The additive effect of additional development on the significant cumulative impact is not mitigated by aluminizing the dome, adding cultural furnishings to the inside of the building, or camouflage paint on the pull boxes, nor is off-site removed mediation. Funding of scholarships while laudable is not mitigation for resource destruction. It's important to note that the applicant has the burden of proving that mitigation measures offered would actually reduce the significant impact of the TMT project proposal to a less than significant level. The university's mitigation measures fail to do this. The TMT FEIS concedes that cumulative past, present, and reasonably foreseeable development activities are already significant, contribute a significant, substantial, and adverse impact, but the TMT would contribute to the existing state of impact, and there are no exceptions to the fourth criterion. The fourth criterion says that the level that that this must not take place. Um, the threshold of significance has already been surpassed on Mauna Kea. The successive recommendations by DLNR staff and successive approvals by BLNR under deceptive assurances by the university that they can be good managers have led to this sorry stat sad state. The TMT project would contribute to that existing impact and it can't be granted a construction permit. Conservation districts were formed for the purpose of conserving, protecting, and, and preserving the important natural resources of the state to promote long-term sustainability. While purporting to do this through appropriate management, the record established through this hearing demonstrates that management appropriate for this purpose is not in place. As board members, it's your duty and your responsibility to protect the people's resources for the future. The eight criteria for permits in the conservation district are clear, and all of them must be addressed. The proposal fails in this regard. Please exercise your duty and deny this permit. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Board member, question? I have one question, Debbie. Should, should, this, uh, should this permit go forward, will you stop going to the mountain? I would not. You would not? I, I will tell you though, when you, when you asked that question of Pua, it occurred to me that when the additional t hotel was built on Hapuna Beach and the place that I always took my children to go was overlaid by a very large hotel that dominated the landscape that was once a fairly beautiful place at Hapuna, I, I don't go there anymore. I've never gone there again. So yes, I would go to Mauna Kea, but it would be heartbreaking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a quick 10 minute break to give our court reporter some much needed rest and opportunities for people to do what they need to do. Conduct, cultural identity for this contested case hearing, a Native Hawaiian cultural practitioner. All petitioners here, including those who claim Clarence, to be Hawaiian. Clarence, can you stop one second? Uh, the folks that are outside the door, could we have you quiet down a little bit? The court reporter is having a hard time listening to the testimony. Do we need to talk louder? No, Clarence, okay. stay. Go ahead. I didn't hear Even Another minute. Oh, Hawaiian subject, racial by U.S. definition, made of one and inside conduct cultural. Yeah, all, all petitioners here, including those who claim to be Hawaiian cultural practitioners, were held to be admitted as parties, having qualified for standing by minute order number six, order regarding standing on May 27, 2011. Furthermore, according to his findings of facts, 
It seems that the hearing officer used some kind of qualified standing, regular standing, plus an additional standing qualification in regards to constitutionally protected Native Hawaiian cultural practice. The HO failed to provide prior notice of his intentions and failed to include such standards for qualification in minute order number one, the notice of standing and pre-hearing conference dated April 10, 2011, or anywhere else. Such error cannot be tolerated in retrospect. There is no discussion anywhere in the record of HO's finding of facts, conclusions of law, or decision that outlines the specific standards that, the, that he would use to evaluate a cultural practitioner's qualifications under the umbrella of constitutionally protected, uh, constitutionally guaranteed protections. The HO further er erred by modifying the standards of proof for civil cases by using Hanapi's cr criminal standards for qualification. To be held to standards that don't exist or noticed must in the least be a violation of petitioner's due process. Additionally, petitioners Mauna Kea Nan Ho and Clarence Kukawakai Cheng were petitioners in the contested case hearing on the Conservation District use application for the construction and operation of six 1.8 meter outrigger telescopes. In that contested case hearing, whether or not these, these petitioners were qualified as Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners was at issue. The HO and that CCH, after hearing, found and concluded that these petitioners were qualified for standing with constitutionally guaranteed protections as Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners. This board confirmed that these petitioners qualified for standing, and so did the Third Circuit Court that heard the appeals, the appeal. Based on the qualification of said petitioners in that CCH and appeal, it is raised judicata, and the HO is, is stopped to re-challenge said petitioners for standing in this CCH. It is especially absurd when the finding and conclusion here is 180 degrees out of kilter, a denial of such protection. The law does not favor such inconsistency and uncertainty, and the HO erred. Mary Pukui in Nana Ikikumu, Look to the Source, Volume 1, page 94, says that in Hawaii's early days, one's name was one of the most, uh, was one of one's most precious possessions, and one's Inoa name was both owned property and a kind of force in its own right. Once spoken, and Inoa took on an existence, invisible, intangible, a kapu, tabu, becoming attached to the name. An example of this phenomenon in real time occurred when applicant's witness, Wallace Ishibashi, in his cross-examination, 9-17-11, transcript on page 105, was on the stand. He was, he was asked a question about his family's almakua relative to Mauna Kea. His response was, well, we take it as, again, every family has their own secret in how they do their thing. But yeah, on Poliahu, which we recognize as the location of where we have in Amakua. But I reserve the right to keep that in the family. As for me, in addition to my hesitancy in reading the actual names of my familial relations, that would, could meet the Hanapi prong two test re reveals at its very foundations, a deep-rooted conflict between the course of the so-called state of Hawaii and long-standing practice and conduct of Hawaiian culture. There must be a simpler way to qualify Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners in legal settings than to unreasonably discriminate against, against their cultural philosophies and conduct, and that is that they don't talk about their genealogies. To refuse to remedy the, the situation by insisting on the use of Hanbi Prong II, among other things, may constitute a violation of due process and civil rights of Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners on Mauna Kea. The Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners here, in addition to verbal and written statements they've made or referred to, have in addition, upon oath, stated that they, as individuals, are Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners. How redundant must be on our and the HOB then, in the face of a cultural and or familiar <coughs> kapu, to not reveal such personal and sensitive information, to insist on requiring additional specific information. To insist on more specific genealogical information would be to improperly discriminate against Hawaiians as cultural practitioners. 
Do Christians have to swear their genealogies upon oath in order to practice their religion? This illogical conclusion, among other things, seems to be a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of Constitutions. Let me state on the record for yet another time that I qualify as the Hanapi Prong 2 standard. This is one of my genealogical lines. Interestingly, some of the names on here that I choose not to reveal on this record are names that are also on Chairman Isla's genealogy. This really turns out to be <coughs> one of the more gravid issues in the CCH. And I would exhort you to pay serious attention to his resolution, as it will be referred to later in this presentation. After all, the question should really be whether petitioners are Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners and not necessarily who their specific ancestors are or when they lived. It should be sufficient to simply state under oath that one is a qualified Native Hawaiian cultural practitioner. Facetiously, should the state start issuing licenses to those who may qualify as Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners? I don't think so. For the HO and BLNR to insist on such a rigid and arid requirement as Hanapi Prong 2 and try to coerce Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners here into violating their family kapu with such requirements is preposterous. But getting back to the, C to the CDUA. Because TMT Observatory Corporation is the party that requires a permit to build the gigantic 18-story telescope, one would expect it to also be the party to submit the CDUA to BLNR, right? Wrong. The applicant is UH Hilo. So the CDUA does not contain a single signature of any authorized TMT person. As an additional point of interest, while one would expect the TMT Corp to be the party opposing the petitioners in the, petitioners in the contested case hearing, as you already know, again, it is not TMT Corp, but UH Hilo. Of course, with UH Hilo as the applicant, one would then naturally assume that a legal relationship exists between it and TMT Observatory Corporation, right? Wrong again. There is no operating agreement between the two. So how can UH Hilo legally submit an application for a third party performer that it has no legal relationship with, such party being responsible for completing the proposed project? In a sane, logical, and legal world, the existence of such an agreement would be fundamental, expected, and required, if only to delineate the rights and obligations of the parties involved. The involvement of UH Hilo in the application process seems to be as a volunteer, facilitator, or initiator with no legal relationship with the party that's supposed to perform all the obligations that would be included with the granting of a permit if indeed one is finalized. Additionally, UH Hilo as an entity of the University of Hawaii, holder of the general lease for Mauna Kea, may have a conflict of interest in all of these dealings. Excuse me. Furthermore, that the actual party in interest, the hopefully responsible party that will raise the funds, submit the designs, comply with all the laws, rules, and regulations, and build the building and its instrumental contents is a corporation without a corporate history, corporate success, corporate assets, etc., should raise an entire battery of questions. What, are the, what is the TMT Observatory's corporation's corporate credibility and credit ability? Not one single iota of this necessary information is in evidence, and no one of consequence, including BLNR, is asking questions about them. So while there is privity, a legal relationship between BLNR and UH Hilo because of the CDUA, there is no privity between UH Hilo and TMT. Therefore, there is no legal relationship between BLNR and TMT. 
And except for the granting of a CDUP with its conditions, no conduit through its legal communications and relations, relations can take place. It continues to be interesting that for, so far, the legal and other expenses for the TMT are over $1 million and rising. Of course, the beneficiary of whatever benefits should accrue, TMT, is packing, picking up the tab, right? Wrong again. It's the University of Hawaii and you, the taxpayer, who are footing the bill. <clears throat> Furthermore, one would expect that TMT Corp, the performer, would be responsible to produce a necessary environmental impact statement. Well, not so. It was UH Hilo's attorneys who hired the firm during the EIS, and I suppose that whomever does the hiring also pays for the service. But remember, there's no operating agreement. So how could there be an arrangement? I'm afraid that again, the taxpayer is footing the bill. Credit must be given to the, to the TMT Corp personnel who creatively enge engineered this business plan to get these multi-million dollar benefits and not have to pay for them. There doesn't seem to be any provision for a subsequent payback either, as there is no agreement that specifies the situation. Heck, further examination reveals that TMT doesn't even have a sublease upon which it could build a telescope that UH Hilo is applying for it to build. And as a consequence of this situation, the rent that BLNR, BLNR should be evaluating for adequacy and compliance is nowhere in sight. Will the amount of rent, when it ap eventually appears, satisfy the recommendations of BLNRs relative to the CDOA that states that TMT remains committed to paying a substantial amount for sublease rent? More so, we also need to be reminded that the individual shareholders members or whatever the constituents of this TMT corporation are, normally by law, not liable for the liabilities of the corporation. In other words, not even the sovereign nation states involved are liable for payment, benefits with no liabilities. Who said there is no free lunch? Well, it is common, if not a necessary practice, that corporations without a history of successes and inadequate credit rating usually require personal guarantees in its commercial transactions to guarantee full performance for its undertakings in case of unexpected contingencies. None has been provided for or required in this situation. Is this reasonable and prudent on BLNR's part? With little or no practical experience, defective decision-making becomes a real possibility. How does BLNR protect the so-called state and its beneficiaries from such contingencies? So whether it is the applicant, in this case UH Hilo, or the builder operator, TMT Observatory Corporation, BLNR should require that one or both of them provide guarantee surety of such proportion to secure and or ensure that, once started, this project will go to full completion. 20% of the fund of the fees collected by the Mauna Kea Land Special Fund <coughs> HRS 304A 2170 are being set aside for payment to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Precedent has been set. It is suggested that this arrangement be further documented in any CDUP that may be granted. While, as, while existing telescopes provide viewing time to UH in lieu of rent, no proportion of equivalent value have ever been shared with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs for its 20% share of all rental proceeds, as far as I know. The proposed CDUP, among other things, does not mention viewing time in any of its discussions. Not only should the subject of viewing time be included in the CDUP, but that 20% of the equivalent value for viewing time to be shared with OA should be mandated. Curiously, TMT will color the pavement of the access way, the roadway to the observatory, to blend with the surroundings, yet it insists, and the HO has gone along with the suggestion, that the coating of the dome will be a reflective aluminum-like coating which will reflect the sky during the day, reducing visibility. <clears throat> To claim that a reflective aluminum-like coating reflects the blue colors of the sky seems to be a figment of somebody's PR myth, surely not reality. In my observa observation, other luminized domes presently on Mauna Kea have always reflected the glare of the sun, but never a blue sky. 
If the roadway and supporting buildings are colored to blend with the surroundings, then I would suggest, even require, to maintain consistency of argument that the dome be colored likewise. After all, my view of an eventual TMT observatory, if it should be built, will be from Waimea, and the dome, colored like its surroundings, will be more tolerable if blended rather than glaring. <clears throat> Relative to spatial relationships in Mauna Kea, the university moves its different physical orientations either from being close to the other observatories of the summit area or at a great distance from them, depending on the advantages or disadvantages of the issue it is addressing. For example, regarding section 13.530 C5 Hawaii Administrative Rules that states, the proposed land use shall be compatible with the locality and surrounding areas appropriate to the physical conditions and capabilities of the specific parcel or parcels. It is so understandable that the university would take a close-in perspective for this one that the proposed TMT observatory would be compatible with the locality and surrounding areas of the other observatories, although the actual proposed TMT observatory location is over a quarter mile away, except for the submillimeter array from the nearest other, other observatory. A quick glance at a map clearly shows how rem remote the proposed TMT observatory is from the cluster of summit observatories. On the other hand, it is undisputed, paragraph 91 of HO's conclusions of law, that cumulative effects of astron astronomical development and other uses in the summit area of Mauna Kea have previously resulted in significant and adverse impacts. The trick here is to locate the TMT observatory as far away from the summit area as possible so as to argue the TMT observatory impacts will be minimally cumulative to the significant adverse impacts undisputedly having already tainted the summit area observatories, or it isn't. It cannot be close for some arguments and far for others. After all, one of the laws of physics is that a thing cannot be in two different places at the same time. Pu Poliahu is the major physical feature on the west side of the Mauna Kea summit area. I can attest to the height of the Pu because it is a challenging hike to the top of its summit. While the sheer size of the proposed TMT for a man-made object, being approximately one-third of Pu Poliahu's height, is monstrous. Moreover, how can the addition of the proposed TMT observatory with spatial dimensions, width, length, and height, practically dwarfing the total of other observatories on Mauna Kea, already declared to constitute significant and adverse impacts, not cumulatively add additional significant and adverse impacts, and not violate the threshold of being significant and adverse, as the HO suggests. While such mental hocus-pocus, along with alchemy and witchcraft, might have a credibility in the dark ages, my modern mind tells me that one cannot subtract or mitigate by adding. The summit area of Mauna Kea is substantially developed. That it occurs in the conservation zone is as mythical as the, as the existence of unicorns. The conservation zone in the summit area has been totally decharacterized by observatories. It is so totally developed that there is no room on it to build a gargantuan facility such as the 30 meter telescope. The character of the summit of Mauna Kea would not be further developed even if the heart of Waikiki were to be transported to the mountain. But such development is not, is not allowed in a conservation district and therefore is not allowed atop Mauna Kea. That there are no guidelines in existence regarding development limits on the mountain is a travesty. It was a major oversight to not have been included in the comprehensive management plan. Moreover, that the negative impact on the mountain is characterized by the number of telescopes on the mountain and not by their sizes and heights. The actual impact of their exist existence seems to be a fallacy. After all, 10 TMT size observ observatories would have a mega impact on the mountain when compared to 10 12 inch size telescopes. In each case, there being 10 of them. But the actual impact of a telescope is, I would guess, more proportional to the cube of its primary lens radius than by its unitized number. To 
shift gears a bit, let me suggest that the CUD, CDUP process does not comply with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples on DRIP. Although President Obama and the United States had initially opposed signing de the declaration, on December 16, 2010, at his second Tribal Nations Conference, he, the President, reversed his earlier decision and stated that he would sign. And indeed, a query to the White House about how the declaration would be implemented was referred to the State Department. Spokeswoman Tiffany Miller responded by email that there is no simple answer. As you know, the declaration has implications for many agencies across the U.S. government, she said. However, I can tell you that the Obama administration is committed to making U.S. support of the declaration, declaration meaningful. Citing Article 32 of UNDRIP, I conclude that this CDUA process is non-compliant with, with the article. Article 32, two. <clears throat> One, indigenous people have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands or territories and other resources. Two, states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free and informed consent, consent prior to the approval of any project affecting their lands or territories and other resources, particularly in connection with the development, utilization, or exploitation of mineral, water, or other resources. Three, states shall provide effective mechanisms for just and fair redress for any such activities and appropriate measures shall be taken to mitigate adverse environmental, economic, social, cultural, or spiritual impact. While I have no knowledge if UNDRIP has been an issue of any appeal in the so-called state of Hawaii yet, I suggest that this board start thinking about the day that it will. In fact, I'll even suggest that the board start paying attention starting with this contested case hearing. The day of reckoning is here. Amy K. Lear, in an article entitled Looking Ahead, Indigenous Peoples and Free, Prior, and Informed Consent stated, the UNDRIP sets forth the responsibility of governments to gain free, prior, and informed consent from indigenous peoples for development pro projects. It has already been cited in national court cases, particularly in Latin America, as support for the requirement that governments seek, f seek free, prior, informed consent from indigenous peoples and cease giving concessions to companies until consent is obtained. Thus, although the UNDRIP addresses governments, it will directly impact companies and in the university in this case. <clears throat> UNDRIP, coupled with the Hawaiian Kingdom's instrument of accession that was filed with the United Nations Secretary General on December 10, 2012, in New York City, that invokes the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court over Hawaiian territory beginning on March 4, 2013, gives notice that a new paradigm is taking place in Hawaii. The ICC prosecutes individuals and not states for war crimes committed within occupied territories. Only states can accede to the jurisdiction of the ICC and that Hawaii achieved the international recognition of its statehood on November 28, 1843 by joint proclamation of Great Britain and France and entered into extensive diplomatic relations and treaties with other states. The justification for the accession was based on two points. First, the, the acting occupying government is not able to enforce and prosecute individuals for violating Hawaiian law and the law of occupation taking place within Hawaiian territory. And second, the U.S. Pacific Command, the occupier, has refused to hold to account individuals for committing war crimes that have been reported since July 6, 2012. According to the United Nations War Crimes Commission, war, crime, war crimes include usurpation of sovereignty during occupation, denationalizing the inhabitants of occupied territory, confiscation of property, wanton devastation and destruction of religious, charitable, educational, and historical buildings and monuments, etc. So please take notice that these developments may eventually apply to you. In, in, in conclusion, I ex exhort you to examine petitioner's arguments on the merits 
and deny the CDOP. And while you're at it, you should reverse the HO's erred findings, conclusions, and deci decision that the Native Hawaiian petitioners here are denied standing for constitutional protections of all rights customarily and traditionally exercised for subsistence, cultural, and religious purposes, and possessed of Ahupua tenants who are descendants of Native Hawaiians who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands prior to 1778. I think this this goes back further than 1778, since there are about 90 generations on here. I thank you. Thank you, Ku. Thanks. So I'm going to ask the question that I've asked of almost everyone else. Should, uh, should the decision stand in Nickel Ford, will you stop going to Mauna Kea? I think that's a very good question. <clears throat> but the answer, I believe, cannot just be a yes or no. Um, however, I will, I will go as far as to say I will not stop going to the mountain. However, as poor Case uh, said earlier, um, every time she goes to the mountain from now on, or f uh, already and continuing, that um, there are compromises, uh, spiritual, mental, these kinds of things that we have to make in order to go up there. I mean, after all, these observatories are not invisible. They're there. And um, we almost, you almost have to sort of condition yourself to ignore them. But let me tell you, it's very hard to ignore. Thank you. Next up is, <clears throat> excuse me, next up is Mauna Kea Aina Ho. Ke aloha. Scotty? Aloha. 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 Um, my name is Ke Aloha Pishoda. I'm here on behalf of Mauna Kea and Aina Ho, um, myself and my family. My kupuna. Um, just for the record, um, I'm going to read from my notes. I uh, in October I, I had a stroke, so I um, don't need real accommodation, I don't think. But um, covering every day and mahalo kia kua. But uh, just so you know, I have a hard time a little bit with uh, words and things. So take your time then. Mm. Um, so I just want to say a small pule uh, for opening, because I will be speaking of the sacred things, and then I will s end it at the end, if that's OK. Aloha kia kua na kua na kua. We ask you abide with us this day as we speak on the sacred issues. Grant us permission to speak to the sacredness of Mauna Kea. We ask blessings for all and those who have traveled far. May they be returned home safely back to their loved ones, and we ask for forgiveness of any trespass that may occur. I will free that prayer when I'm done. Um, Mauna Kea is sacred because in our cosmology, or our worldview, Mauna Kea is an origins place. For us, it is here where the heavens and the earth come together and where all life forms originate from. It is a temple but not one made by man, but rather made for man, so that man could learn the ways of the heavens and the laws of the earth. And man could learn how do we live in relationship with the earth, and how do we live in relationships to the heavens and to each other. According to our Mu'olelo, or oral history, the god Kane was chosen by the Akua before him and made him the one who brought down the baskets of knowledge so that mankind could live rightly. In the Kumulipo, the chant of creation, we learn before man was born, mostly all other living things were born before him, thus teaching us our place in the world. The Po, the infinite potential, the great cause of all life, is where we came from. We came later, and all those before us came there from there also. 
and they become our older siblings. And when they are under attack, we defend them. And we ask that the unraveling of creation not begin. Because after all the science we have on Mauna Kea, we don't have any science that teaches us how to bring our species back from extinction. And that is not permitted, that is not our human right to have. Um, so this is what Mauna Kea represents. It represents our zenith and our ties to creation itself. And it is this basis that gives it its power and also that it is the sentinel of the Pacific. There is no other like Mauna Kea. So when we ascend to do ceremony, we ascend back through the genealogy of creation to the point at which the Po and the Light were given birth to. So before I get into the substance of the issues involved, I have to digress a moment to address the university's latest allegation, and that is that it goes something like, w they know that we're Hawaiian, but we never proved it. Um, and therefore, have no constitutional protections for our cultural and religious practices that we execute on Mauna Kea, or our native Hawaiian rights, in other words. Um, you know, I've tried to think of ways <laughs> to explain the fallacy of this, uni this argument um, without sounding terse, but I can't. So this allegation is simply ridiculous and preposterous. Um, I cannot believe uh, that the university, uh, which is considered our center of higher learning, um, <coughs> would take this position. And I, I don't even know how to respond, but I have to. So these are some of my reasons why that is a fallacious argument uh, and should be struck. Um, first, the university misconstrues the law, attempting to apply a criminal standard to this case. Uh, that is where Native Hawaiians use their constitutional Hawaiian rights to launch an affirmative defense against criminal trespass charges. But we are not criminals, um, and this case is not a criminal case, but a civil case involving Native Hawaiian traditional and customary practitioners who are attempting to continue to practice their constitutionally protected rights on public, ceded, and undeveloped lands, which is exactly what Hash case was all about, and exactly what the court was seeking to protect against in that Pash case. Further, because many of us, and that is at least Mr. Nevis, Mr. Ching, Ms. Ward, and I have been previously found to have standing not only by this board, but by both a state case and a federal case, uh, more than one state case actually. Um, and so, the university is consequently barred from challenging us at this point. You know, the courts can't make flip-flop decisions. So um, that's, that's our position. So um, we have six other reasons in our briefs, and I won't go into those right here, but I would encourage you to review at least uh, our Native Hawaiian uh, rights section um, for, for that area in our brief. So. So returning to the issues at hand before us today, why we're here, why we're here before this board. The short answer is we're here today because BLNR said yes when they should have said no. The job of any regulatory agency, including BLNR, is to regulate, and that means sometimes it needs to say no to projects like the 30-meter telescope yeah. that are inconsistent with the purpose and mandate that govern the Mauna Kea Conservation District. But we have been coming and asking the same thing for a long, long time, years now, coming to BLNR to ask that they do their job, which is to conserve our natural resources, such as our lands, the animals, to protect the Native Hawaiian and the public's rights. We began in the 90s trying to have input in the UH new development plans, which which it planned to exceed the legal limits of 13 telescopes allowed on Mauna Kea. The plan agreed upon, uh, agreed upon by not only the university, but BLNR. And if my, sorry, <laughs> call it one. Um, and if my memory s serves me correctly, when we first began coming before the BLNR, it was 
six chairpersons ago. We had Mike Wilson, Gil Coloma Agaron, Peter Young, Timothy Johns, Laura Thielen, and there was another one, and I can't remember his name. Oh, Alan Smith, and then now you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to find justice, we have had to come before the BLNR in contested case hearings to compel them to follow the rules, the statutes, and the Constitution that are already written. We're not asking for anything new. Um, and that failing, we went to the courts. We went to a federal court, we went to the Third Circuit Court, we went to the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Now, all of the state courts found in our favor. I think it's safe to say that we have fulfilled our civic duty. And as Judge Hara affirmed, our rights have been prejudiced because we have had to go beyond um, our normal duty our, as regular citizens and engage in these contested case hearings and the court cases. Um, so i just like to point that out. Um, we've had We've had to go and endure all of this because Bill and R has acted in a political rather than, than um, as a trustee, which is proposed in the Admissions Act and in contradiction of the law. Bill and R is empowered to conserve and care for the land and they are specifically not mandated, not mandated to be proponents of development such as the TMT Corporation and that's why we're here today. The state recognizes the conservation districts of Mauna Kea's importance as well because they have created laws specifically protecting Mauna Kea. And under state law, it is considered, um, uh, the, under state law, public lands are held in trust for only two beneficiaries, Native Hawaiians and the general public. The state is but a trustee, not the owner. The public and the Native Hawaiians are the owners. The state holds and has and continues to have an affirmative duty to protect it on behalf of the right holders, the owners who are the Native Hawaiians and the general public. This is affirmed in the Admissions Act. In short, BLNR is mandated primarily to conserve our lands and natural resources, period. So we're here because the Constitution affirms that Native Hawaiians have a right to continue their traditional and customary practice on public lands. And because the public has a right to a clean and healthful environment, and BLNR is required to protect that on their behalf. But this is not what's happening. What's happening is that BLNR has not chosen to protect those rights that they're mandated to protect, but they're there to protect the rights instead of the residents of Pasadena, California. The residents, more specifically, of the corporate members of the Pasadena. The rights of citizens of other countries like Japan, France, the United Kingdom, instead of um, those who the laws were there to protect. We know foreign citizens have no rights here, or at least land rights. So the real question that needs to be answered His testimony is testimony that was given earlier. So I give you an opportunity because it's unsolicited to a to place objections onto the record. Well, Trevor Sanayla, as a matter of record, I would like a copy for myself to... Okay. Come on. Sorry about that. And to the extent that it's a summary of um, Mr. Flores' uh, oral argument, I, I would not object to it actually coming in. However, I would actually ask the board to disregard any um, anything on this this document which was not included in his his oral argument uh, I, I believe that we, we are entitled or the parties are entitled to submit some reason in fact I think the um, the court reporters actually asked for any copies of any written summaries, uh, so I think it's proper. But again, I, uh, I would, um, I, I would, uh, I would agree to having it submitted, with the understanding that that none of the argument is evidence itself, um, and if there's anything on this document that's not reflected in his oral argument as reviewed and in the transcripts you'll get that we ask that it not be included. Okay. And then the second, second set of documents was uh, handed to us unsolicited. Uh, res described basically as uh, Hawaiian Kingdom documents to, to the jurisdiction of international court. So you've had an opportunity. 
Um, I, I have seen that. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I would object to the introduction of any documents or, or presentations or any material submitted by anyone that's not a party to this. This is not a public hearing. It's not a public meeting. It's a, it's oral argument on a contested case, and it would be inappropriate to include that on the record or is even part of the oral argument. Okay. It's not that I'm objecting to the substance. I, I have no judgment on the substance itself. It is actually what I believe is a, a not an appropriate inclusion on, on this, this contested case. Okay. Thank you. Is it challenge to submit a rebuttal to that objection? Actually, it's, it's not necessary. Well, you're a party, so do you have an... Go ahead. Do you have so, it's not, so it's not relative to that one. It's relative this one. to the initial one. So the, what was initially sent and submitted was a summary of our, our presentation of testimony. It was dated February 12, 2013. And I don't believe that the, in, the, in the case of this oral arguments that the applicant can object to what we present to the board at this time. He's only objecting if there is anything that wasn't in your presentation. But what, why can I <coughs> send, present something at this point in time as part of this all? 30 minutes are, 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 just 30 minutes of those given because to the petitioners. Why, why, why is he allowed, the applicants, the legal counsel allowed to object to what I, anything that I submit at this point? Because he hadn't had time to review the documents like all the other evidence that was put into the record. Yeah, but neither does he have time to review the, the evidence or documents that people are presenting in this in the time they're given. Well, so. Procedurally, he, he has the he has the opportunity to object, and then at some point, we will, in our deliberations, rule on his objection in terms of what gets put in. Okay. okay. I, just, I just want to make that clarification. Okay. I'll put that clarification at that point. Thank you. And again, Mr. Flores has made the he has made the representation that this actually reflects or <coughs> reflects his oral argument itself. So uh, okay. I, I understand his his concern. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So you now have your rebuttal time. And uh, you have 14 minutes on the clock. You want to time check? Or no, I don't know. Thank you. I would have to agree with Ms. Peshota's statement that there's nothing new that's been presented by the petitioners today. Um, as she noted, that they have actually repeatedly been before um, uh, the board and the department on, on, on many of these claims. In fact, all of these claims, you will actually see in, um, that, that all the issues that they've raised has actually been addressed. All of these things are actually uh, reviewed, um, considered, and and um, considered by the hearing officer in his proposed findings of fact, conclusions of law uh, that you have, and and again, there's a. Um, um, we believe that we have actually responded to them, and we will rest on our, our opening statements that we made earlier, as well as the documents which we have submitted in response to that same those same claims, um, including um, our exceptions to our suggested exceptions uh, to supplement uh, the proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law, as well as our response to uh, the petitioner's um, um, objections. So thank you. Um, if there's any questions that the board has, we're uh, available for, for answering. Any questions, board members of the university? Thanks. No? Okay. I would add one thing, also, Chairperson Isla. Um, um, I would note that the board does have the discretion to deliberate now and vote now. And I understand that you, you've, you've already made a statement that the board will, will deliberate subsequently on this. Um, but I'll also join with, with uh, Ms. Townsend's request that uh, the board um, um, deliberate expediently and uh, come quickly back to the parties for a determination on this. Thank you. Okay, we will take both of those requests under consideration.